question Ian is the following. Um, I mean, last night during dinner we discussed a little bit about this and I think we can agree that bilingualism in Canada is at best like a, a rhetorical fiction that is somewhat meant to pacify the antagonism between French and English in Canada, right? So it's not really a bilingual country, but a country where some people speak French and some people speak English. Uh, but also bilingualism is also like, you know, fraud, it's a fraud concept, it's also a very exclusionary concept that somewhat ignores the, the complexity of Canada beyond the French and English divide. So now, from the specific perspective of literary studies, uh, I'm wondering what is the potential in Canada for a real dialogue between these two uh, problematic uh, hegemonies. So for instance, in Quebec, when someone is studying ca Canadian literature, where are you going to do it? You're going to do it in a literature department, right? So where you will be either registered in a Littérature Française program or Littérature Québécoise program or maybe in an English literature. Uh, program and then in English Canada I mean if you study in Canadian literature it's not in the literature department usually but in an English department uh, specifically or maybe in French studies in some uh, instances so it seems to me that uh, at the university level institutionally speaking not even this very fraught and or very limited concept of Canada's bilingual or, or bicultural even that very limited and fraught concept seems to not even be like possible or can even be accomplished. So um, uh, my question is that other than turning all literature departments into comparative literature departments uh, or giving up entirely on this rhetorical fiction which is bilingualism, like what, what other options to teaching Canadian literature across the linguistic divide do, do you see uh, at the university level, if any? Well, this is a very good question. <laughs> And it's a very good question directed to Glendon and uh, to Glendon's programs, especially um, programs that are um, the pillars of bilingualism, which would be the French department and the English department. Um, but I agree with you on one very important point, that the limitation of an image of Canada to these two languages is a very limiting vision of Canada. Um, there are many solitudes in Canada. And probably in both the English and the French departments, there are uh, cutting edge courses and cutting edge professors who are looking outside the box, looking at uh, translated works, looking at uh, comparative literature. And in our faculty, we have uh, comparativists in each of those three departments, uh, Spanish, uh, French and English. The largest number of um, double majors in Blenden is between English and French. So most of our students are particularly in the English department bilingual. Uh, our English as a international language program is trying to make them trilingual um, with Spanish as the third, the third language. But um, the role of literature in crossing those borders I could have named a few texts that are from French Canada that are being taught in the English department in translation. Uh, David Fenario is one, uh, Balconville, uh, the Incendie, uh, Scorched, you know, is another. And uh, there are initiatives whereby English literature or literature written in English or literature translated into English is used to enter spaces which would be more, more appropriate perhaps in traditional faculties to sociology or to um, women's studies or to international studies. For example, uh, one of the students who recently graduated wrote his um, uh, honors thesis on Romeo and Juliet in Kuwait, where uh, Romeo was Shia and um, Juliet was um, Sunni. And he's carried this forward. In fact, he's going to be a theater director in Kuwait. And he's a graduate of our English department. So the notion of world literature through English, of French-Canadian literature through English, as well as French-Canadian literature in the French department, shows that at least we are, we are trying. 
We aren't exactly the avant-poste de la francophonie that uh, François Mitterrand described us as being many years ago. In fact, I shook his hand and I haven't watched it since. <laughs> but il faut imaginer si si fera. Yeah. This is an hour-long conversation that I would like to have with you, but I'd like to just, just two quick points. In my field is Canadian literature, I teach uh, French-Canadian literature in translation, as they say, but just two quick points. Uh, one, uh, this is an asymmetrical relationship. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, so on one hand, paradoxically, you might think, the interest in English Canada in French Canadian literature in translation is far greater than the French Canadian interest in English Canadian literature. We know that to be a fact. Uh, uh, you might say that it's the same kind of phenomenon that governs the Irish productivity in English literature and so on and so forth. You know, there are many, many explanations for it, but it's an asymmetrical relationship. Uh, secondly, um, so I frequently teach the uh, French Canadian texts in translation in uh, in English Canadian literature classes but but that misses your larger point I think that's the smaller point the larger point is that as long as it's thought in Canada that teaching a, a text in translation in, importing it into an English Canadian literature class for example is some kind of adventurous or da or dangerous or or extraordinary act we're in trouble so it's meant, it was McLennan's dream that English and French Canada would approach each other and recognize each other and complement each other. The way it's used all the time, Ian just did it, I do it, you do it in the press all the time, is to talk about the separation of the two solitudes, which is exactly what McLennan did not intend, which to me underwrites the culture's explicit rejection of the bilingual, the alleged bilingual nature of the country. We're not bilingual. Some of us speak French and English, some of us speak English and French, but we're not a bilingual nation. We might be a multilingual nation in pockets, but we're certainly not bilingual in any official way. So I think you're right. <coughs> so I, I would just like to make a point of, of clarification following on from the Ellen uh, response. Um, so the question is, of course in Canada is a provincial responsibility, not a national responsibility. And at the provincial level, there has been a proliferation of documents, of bureaucratic pre prescriptions for curricular organization, as I understand it, uh, and for pedagogies. Um, a really famous one in Ontario was the Hall-Dennis report that revolutionized teaching. Um, in that area. I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I have seen uh, many, many documents um, that have come from uh, the Manitoba Ministry for high school education in foreign languages and multicultural education. Um, so that I, do, I, I think that, and then there's always, <laughs> there's always a sense that the documents are always a little behind the practice of the sense of needs in the classroom. There's always a challenge to those documents. There are always people who want to go back to basics and there's always the documents that stress um, the autonomy and agency of students. So, so I, I think that in Canada we do have a similar kind of bureaucratization in terms of policy documents and a similar gap in terms of of how those documents translate into practice and then how they are adjudicated in, um, in assessment. I could not teach one influential book um, by an author who didn't meet that criteria. Um, the same thing when I taught at the University of British Columbia. Um, I remember I wanted to teach, um, oh, what was it called, uh, The Woman Warrior? Um, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston to the first year students because a number of our first year students were uh, Chinese or Chinese Canadian. And people in the curricular meeting said, who would make such a stupid suggestion? This is not a proper novel. Um, the students must read Jane Eyre. So all our first year students read Jane Eyre. Uh, how, to, how to kill you know, a love for, for literature. So it, it depends, again, on the university, uh, the department chair and the department has a lot of autonomy uh, in Canada for how curriculum's organized.
Robert? I think I just uh, pick up on what you're saying to uh, try and address uh, some of the questions. Uh, I'll begin with Niels. Uh, because this issue of the, the, the power of bureaucracy, the, 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 the power of the documents uh, in terms of uh, transforming or producing uh, 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 anything related to actual practice, uh, uh, the practice of teaching. Uh, well, I, I would say, uh, I, I would take the three examples that I'm working with uh, to say that, well, uh, that depends on the case. Uh, let us take, for example, the, 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 the first document, the PCN 1999, uh, 2002. Uh, it did actually uh, produce uh, 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 very, very clear and, and uh, uh, intense effects uh, on uh, secondary teaching uh, in Brazil. How do I explain that power? Or, I mean, how do I see that power? Uh, uh, I think uh, it, it is a, a, a top-down uh, top uh, 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 endeavor uh, in the sense that it was uh, uh, created and produced uh, by some uh, uh, university uh, uh, centers. Uh, I, I can locate, for example, PUC uh, in Sao Paulo as uh, the, the most powerful of them. Uh, and then uh, the, the way that spread uh, through uh, academic production, uh, through the document, uh, 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 government policy and, and, and uh, uh, continued education programs, uh, publications, uh, but in a top-down, uh, uh, very uh, authoritarian fashion. Uh, and in that sense, it did uh, 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 affect uh, uh, the teaching of uh, languages in Brazil a lot. If we compare that, for example, to the uh, Literatura document in uh, 2006, uh, it produced nothing. Uh, it's virtually uh, 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 ignored by anyone uh, in the academy, uh, in uh, secondary schools. Uh, there's no uh, uh, there's no academic uh, uh, um, articulation. Uh, 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 there's no publication. I have here two books that were uh, uh, If uh, we're going to have a, a, a conference at CBLI in Rio de Janeiro, uh, now at the beginning of September. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, hundreds of presentations on language teaching. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, part of a session of six works. Uh, uh, and all of the literature related, literature related works are there, but not all of them are teaching specifically. So just to give an idea of uh, how the teaching of literature uh, and the document have not produced any, the document have, has not produced any anything significant in terms of that. Uh, so that has to do with the, 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 the idea of, uh, again, the, the power structure that's behind it uh, in terms of the academic uh, uh, centers, etc. And then I, I want to come to the example of Orientações uh, Curriculares uh, uh, in a foreign language, which then maybe Valkyrie and then can talk about it. But it, uh, and, and, and for me, that would be, I guess, in between those two, the top down and the uh, 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 absolutely forgotten or marginal other examples, uh, the best uh, 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 case we have now. Uh, it is, it, it, uh, uh, why, why do I say that? First, because uh, um, the document in itself is not prescriptive, as the, uh, in, in opposition to the PCN, which is highly prescriptive uh, in that sense. The document, uh, 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 it, uh, it, it's much more uh, honest to the idea of guidelines, much more uh, aware of uh, 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 the notions of difference, uh, 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 local and global. Well, uh, you all know the documents, but anyway, so the document itself is a different uh, and reveals different uh, 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 perspectives, theoretical, a different th theoretical stance on the, on the subject. So uh, what I would say is in terms of how, what's the power of bureaucracy, uh, it, 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 it all depends. What I would say is that uh, probably in the case of literary teaching, uh, I would advocate for something along the lines of what the, the National Project has done. Well, a revision of the document because of the theoretical tensions and problems that I, uh, I think it, it presents, uh, 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 but also uh, uh, followed by something uh, uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, an articulation uh, uh, on, the, on different levels, uh, uh, bottom up, top down, uh, inclusive, collaborative, uh, with, uh, based on different notions of uh, 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 mini making of what culture is, to address a little bit what uh, Nara uh, uh, asked. Uh, and maybe I, I should take the opportunity to suggest that uh, Valkyrie and Mario 
uh, yeah, uh, get involved in that. I mean, uh, and if they have the energy to <laughs> open up a new front for their for their work, uh, but I think that's something that. Uh, I think Lee would like to say. And ho I've got uh, Roberto and um, Hosani and Lynn. And my memory card's gonna die. So, um, Roberto first, I guess. That's the first. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to add something to Roberto. Uh, I think these documents they have more effects on, on some course books and also on. And, and also at the university as well, because we, we were talking that there is one policy for, uh, uh, you know, from year one to year nine and, and higher education is, is different. But I think this document, there are some effects on the, on the, the university uh, context as well, specifically for, for those working with teacher education. They have to, you know, most of them read the PCNs and are saying at the university as well. Although they don't have effect on the on, on the uh, on what is, is taught at university, but I think they have effect on some modules that prepare students to go to to the to the school. I don't know if you agree with that, but I think that uh, one of the problem with this document with the policy is that the, the investment is more uh, focused on designing uh, proposals for schools, and then they have the documents, they have course books for these documents. The last two um, uh, Plan Nacional do Livro Didático, that is a specific uh, policy to send books to schools. So these books were written according to these uh, documents. So I think there is this effect on the on the on the the course books, but the investment stops, you know, in the bureaucracy. There is no investment on teacher education with these documents. So they have a new policy, they have a new proposal, but then the teach, most of teachers don't know how to read these documents. And some of them, they don't know how to use these course books. So I think this is kind of, they have different kind of policies. Okay, thanks. Before I turn to um, Lynn Mario, I, I, I want to throw out a question. There may not be time to have an answer, but I would like to hear um, the student perspective on the topics that we've been uh, discussing today. Some of the people a bit closer. Um, I know Jessica, for example, began her work in an English department and then chose to go into a cultural studies department for her PhD. Uh, I don't know about uh, Johnny and Sean, um, Jamia, the choices you made, or how you perceive these questions as a student moving through the system. So I'll just throw that out for now if any of you would like <coughs> to jump in with a response. Uh, but turn to Lynn Mario now uh, to follow on. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Diana, because it's related to that. Uh, I had uh, addressing Roberto and uh, talking about the policy issues. Uh, a research project now uh, 20 years ago on the teaching of literature and it, it was uh, I looked at the documents and I looked at the classroom uh, practice of the teaching of literature in uh, at the university and in uh, high school in uh, uh, foreign language literature teaching and uh, mother tongue literature teaching and uh, Roberto it's it's shocking it hasn't changed very much because I had the opportunity to look at, to look at it uh, informally recently. Uh, there's a lot of uh, tradition. It's connected to what Varkiria had mentioned earlier. There's a, a literature is seen basically still um, as a, e even by our Marxist colleagues who, who promote the uh, literary criticism, at, at, especially at my university. Literature is seen as elitist and, exclu and uh, the instrument of social exclusion, even by our Marxist colleagues. That's how they, they do it in practice. And how, how does this work? It's presupposed that uh, first there's a, a separation between pedagogy and the teaching of literature. They consider pedagogues to be below uh, anyone connected with literature. The teaching of literature is, is connected with interpretation and uh, the domain of literary theory. If you bring education involved, it's reducing the literary value, the aesthetic value of literature to the functional value of literature. I just want to add that to, to yeah. work a little bit for Bokir. I, I, I know that uh, on, those, on their, those doors, uh, yeah. education and uh, literature, literature department, and uh, 
was rejected. So Bokhi then took me in. So, so, so the, mechanism, the mechanism of exclusion goes through language, and that's where we come in. Uh, because they will say that, uh, uh, oh, our students don't have enough language to appreciate literature, both in, uh, in foreign language uh, literature teaching and in mother tongue literature, literature teaching. So the exclusion happens in the fourth year of primary school, right, where, the, where that was, uh, that's a problem for our system, where the dropout rate is, is huge. So very few students get to uh, high school uh, mother tongue liter literature teaching and those who do are always seen as deficient because they don't, uh, you know, they can't even speak Portuguese properly so how can we expect them to, to learn literature. So it's, it's always reduced a functional teaching of literature for the vestibular. Right? Uh, and uh, at the university the same thing happens, they don't know uh, they don't know enough language, so how can we teach them literature? Huh? And I I if you think I'm exaggerating, our ideologue, our, our Marxist literary theory ideologue was Antonio Cândido, as you, if you're in Brazilian, you know him. Uh, he's 80-something. He's a very important figure in, in politics in Brazil. He's not a politician, he's an intellectual. Like, he's the standard classical left-wing intellectual. Uh, who developed a critical uh, left-centered uh, critical uh, literary criticism and even methods of teaching literature. And in an interview he gave in the press uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure what, it, he was 90 or 87 or something, and uh, uh, one of the, his answers I think was is paradigmatic of, of this whole problem which they claim to, to attack but they, they maintain. Where the reporter after long uh, a long interview on the state of Marxism in Brazil and uh, if, if there is still social justice where he makes these very important statements. And then the, uh, the reporter, the interviewer asks him, um, oh professor, and uh, uh, what are you reading? What, uh, which literary authors are you, are you reading nowadays? Who, which of the new writers are you reading? And he very curtly said, oh no, I still read the classics. Yeah? And so if you're worried about Jane Eyre, that's, it's the classics, but still, so, you know, throw everything critical that we'd like to see in literature. Literature is the instrument of social exclusion, still, unfortunately. So, so have we any, any feedback? Um, any other people who would like to jump in and how, how this sounds to you from your location in the institution or, or the nation? Well, I guess I should say something. I should say, you know, what our thoughts are as students. Um, the first thing that I was thinking about in terms of moving from uh, literary studies to cultural studies, one of the things that's really struck me in the conversations over the last couple of days is that um, thinking about, like, introducing uh, epistemic breaks with, you know, hegemony or um, non-canonical uh, organizations of literary studies, uh, is that when I entered into literary studies, I wanted to know Plato. I wanted to have read Greek, ancient Greek and Latin. I studied both of them because I wanted to occupy a sort of normatively middle class subjectivity that I understood as being achievable through a liberal education. You know, and so in many ways, I think that people try to. Um, ameliorate their own situations, not necessarily by always, and I'm not, you know, I'm just talking generally, that um, similarly to what somebody said yesterday about teaching, um, teaching English as a second language in a mainstream or hegemonic or neoliberal way, people have desires that are legitimate and that aren't necessarily going to be amenable to uh, the sort of radical work that I became interested in that sort of precipitated my move into cultural studies, you know, right away in an undergraduate program. And um, gosh, I mean, another thing that comes to mind, and this is just the only other thing I'll say, is that uh, there, I was really interested in the conversations today about genre studies and the move from genre studies as like a structuralist idea to critical literacies and productive meaning making. And um, one of the things I thought was that that seems a bit uh, like artificially opposed. Like I don't know that it's necessarily quite that opposed in practice necessarily that genre studies is structuralist and deterministic. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about was that uh, when Ian, you were talking about the combination of studying history and English, and you had that really interesting anecdote to share, one of the things that I wondered is um, whether or not genres were being taken into account uh, in the context of 
like uh, historical methodologies. So like Hayden, Hayden White, as a historian, would say there's an aesthetic to every form of writing. Uh, historians write in a realist aesthetic genre, and that has aesthetic effects, and that we need to be alive to those. And I was thinking um, what I saw as a value in cultural studies uh, and critical theory when I moved out of literary studies was that there is a sort of aliveness in Canada, at least to the idea of um, knowledge production through the arts as a kind of scholarly activity that's been very, um, I think, you know, sort of widening the epistemic practices around uh, indigenous knowledges, for example. I didn't necessarily say that as clearly as I may have wanted, but I think you see what I mean, that, you know, I have a friend who's doing beading as her PhD project, right? And she has to produce a document as well. But that is a way of um, creating these sort of epistemic breaks that we're, we're all sort of looking for that I thought was really productive, that interests me, and that I'd like to develop, trying to be alive to the aesthetic genre of my own writing, or, you know, ways of being with knowledge. So, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any other thoughts people would like to share at this moment? I mean, I can reflect kind of very generally about my own experience. Um, almost 20 years ago, I did my undergraduate in English literature and philosophy, and I only came to applied linguistics through professional development from language teaching that I entered into later in my life. And the way that I was taught, the way that I was taught English literature back then in the early 90s, um, it was very specifically an English literature component to my degree. I think I took one or two courses in American literature very much the classics. And in terms of what I draw from now, in terms of my critical thinking, as an applied linguist, it's nothing from what I learned in that English literature component of my undergraduate degree, and it's all coming from the philosophy component of the undergraduate degree. Perhaps I could say something about my experience as a PhD student. I have a pretty much heterogeneous background. As a BA student, I started off in Belém, my hometown in Pará, and then I moved to Curitiba, and then I went to Sao Paulo. And the good thing about that was that I could uh, somehow get a sense of the peculiar uh, trends in each one of those schools and cities. Uh, and also, uh, what I, I, I see as a general trend is something that we were discussing yesterday over lunch, which is this great divide between linguistics and literature. And how, as a student, I never really felt so attached to it. I always experimented and I, I didn't buy the great divide. And so I, I, we have a certain room for flexibility at USP, like choosing our own courses uh, as MA and PhD students. So I always try to uh, take uh, linguistics and anthropology courses, other, not, not just cultural studies courses and literature courses. And Ling Mario, uh, actually, uh, since he has students that come from uh, diverse backgrounds and who have so many uh, different interests. He, uh, I think he was the, the perfect supervisor to, to have someone uh, with such diverse interests as well. And, and yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Johnny. Yeah. Sean. Um, oh, Sean. That's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just reflecting on, on, on that as well, I mean, I feel very fortunate in the sense that literature has actually played a very critical role in, in my formation of uh, um, uh, my intellectual development in terms of, you know, my undergraduate work was actually in women's studies and, and literature courses played a very, very important role in, um, in exploring uh, feminist theory, post-colonial theory. Um, but then coming out of that space, out of uh, those more metropolitan centers that I had gone to for university, going back to the regional, smaller um, colleges and universities of you know, my home communities, um, I found it was actually a, a sort of systematic devaluation of, of um, our local resources. So this is this, um, you know, an underestimating of the capacity of local knowledge. Um, and so, actually, I had proposed a course at Algoma University, one of the, uh, one of the, the colleges in my, my 
area that was um, about African American women's literature, um, bringing in post-colonial theory into, into that program. And uh, I didn't hear back from them, and finally I, uh, I hassled them and, and received word that, you know, we, we thought this was more of a graduate level course. I mean, this isn't, this is too much for a third year level. Um, the idea of, first of all, exploring alterity <laughs> um, it, through literature, and then also bringing in sort of more theoretical aspects uh, on top of, uh, you know, reading nice stories. So, um, in that context, I mean, I think that we are still also dealing with the, this sort of regional dynamic of the uh, idea that ideas are produced someplace else. And in the regions of Canada, in, in the rural spaces, we don't have this, um, like I said, there's just that, that systematic devaluation of our own capacity for understanding. I'll add something really briefly because I know we probably want to get to lunch soon. Um, yeah, all of the talks really made me reflect on my own experiences as a student too. I just finished up my undergrad last year and I was an English major and a history minor. So when you're talking about uh, Ian historicizing of narratives, that's something that was important to my undergraduate studies. And I think the, the reciprocal relationship between history and English was something interesting for me because not only to historicize literature, but to think of history as a narrative itself and sort of the reciprocal way that they feed into each other and help you to reconceptualize each other. But I, I stuck with English for my now, uh, my second degree now and it was because I, I was able to meet some faculty members and read some texts and explore some things that let me sort of feel like it was becoming more of a cultural studies sort of atmosphere and sort of my impression of the transition has been you sort of have to pay your dues to convention, convention and generic considerations before you're able to attempt to be subversive like I, I read Jane Eyre and I actually like Jane Eyre but I don't want to spend my career studying texts like Jane Eyre but I feel like to get permission to move beyond those things I had to, I had to read Shakespeare and Chaucer and do all of that sort of stuff so um, yeah looking at my MA studies now the, the transition into less canonical works has been really exciting and yeah it was good to think about all that in the context of the talks today. I should probably clarify the Jane Eyre reference because I too, you know, I read it. I, I read it as a teenage girl and loved it. Uh, but I, we're talking about a first-year compulsory course for every student at UBC. 3,500 students: physics, chemistry, engineering. Compulsory. The only English course they will ever take. So not designed for English majors. Um, so again, uh, I think we just need to think about audience and context. And I really appreciate um, you jumping in to help us think about how how this operates in different places and times. I think that all the comments in this last session remind us of the importance of what Valkyria stressed in her paper, how the continuing colonialism that infects so much of the, the work that we do and how we need to negotiate around it. So let's take an hour and a half for lunch.